are these people? <laughs> Why is it hard to know how many independent voters there are? This is the story I was super excited to do with you because we are both like viciously, vigilantly independent and anti-duopoly yes. and, and anti-corporate. So so we, we remember, of course, what happened here. Voters waiting in line with masks in t Wisconsin in November of 2020. But yep. in March, they sent everybody to the polls to vote in a rigged primary with COVID uh, and then threatened Bernie and said that if you don't drop out, we're going to keep making everybody go to the yep. polls knowing that we, that you're going to lose. And then you're blame kill you. people. Yep, you're going to yeah. murder people. <laughs> yeah. So this is from the Love conversation. It. Right? Okay. Uh, and it says, modern U.S. politics has largely been viewed through the lens of a two-party power structure, Democrats and Republicans. Huh. However, this may be changing. Increasingly, the media, pollsters, pundits, and campaigns themselves are focusing on independent voters, saying they will be crucial to the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. Fuck around and find out, I remember saying a long time ago. Right? So, yep. but even among political experts, there remains a good deal of disagreement on how many of these voters there are out there. Right? It's possible that some voters identify as independent, but really just have weaker political preferences than party diehards while still maintaining some loyalty to one party or the other. Yeah, I don't really care, but I'm still going to vote Democrat in the end. You know, and there's a lot the of people like that. Window. Yeah. Right? And some independent voters change their political identification from one cycle to another. I mean, look, I did. I've, I have joined the Democratic Party to vote for Bernie. Independent my whole life. Joined the Democratic Party to vote for Bernie. Bailed on him. As soon as he was, as soon as 2020 was over. That makes it hard to tell who an independent voter is and how many of them exist. Well, sort of, but most most of what political researchers like this guy know about what independence comes from survey data. But here's part of the problem that though it might seem simple to look at state records of voter registrations, it's not very useful because many states right. require voters to declare a party affiliation when they register. Though they can also declare that they have no affiliation, and that's what I had to do in New Jersey is no affiliation. Um, and, of course, some states require voters to join a major party to be allowed to vote in their primaries. Like That's the way our state is. You here. have to be, you have to declare on the outside of your ballot, uh, outside of the envelope, if you are voting Republican or Democrat. How insane is that? Like, how is that not illegal? Right? Swing state voters matter, Anthony. Yes. Swing state voters. <laughs> <laughs> Get those swing staters. Yes. Uh, but uh, other states don't. Uh, don't require you to be to join a party and some like in this person's home state of Arizona prevent people who register as independents from voting in presidential primaries but let them vote in primaries from other races so long as they request a ballot from one of the parties uh, just more hoops and make it more difficult to, to yeah. vote and to participate in the process thanks a lot guys right these different rules mean that the numbers from state records are almost certainly not reflective of the true number of people who are independent voters. And they also are reliable indicators of how people might actually vote. So researchers do have two good sources that have tracked political affiliation over a long period of time, which is Gallup surveys. And Gallup is incredibly biased and <laughs> infiltrated in corporate run. No. And... Uh, American National Election Studies, which is a collaboration of universities, which, all, of course, is also heavily biased and skewed. The number of independents these surveys report, however, depends on how the surveyors classify independents. But they may not take into account how specific voters' political preferences change over time. It's like... So, here's how Gallup frames the whole conversation and how you get your duopoly framed. The Gallup question dates back, do you consider yourself a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent? The voters' answer is about their present situation and may be different from whatever affiliation they may have declared when registering to vote. So it may be on a state log that they, that, that's different from what they answer there. And it may also be different from how they voted in the past. Again, we voted Democrat for Bernie and joined the, po the poll for, for Bernie. But according to Gallup... I can't say that. <laughs> well, you were a delegate. So I know, but I was a I've always voted Democrat. I had voted Democrat my whole entire life up until 20 well, till 2016 when I started voting Green Party. 
You were a good little Democrat. Okay. Well, I was, I towed the family line. I mean, HDR, FDR, he saved us, you know, like I was taught that growing up. The Democrats are the ones that help the workers, that help the poor, that want to do stuff. Republicans are just selfish and greedy and all they care about is money, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're fed as Americans. Well, that's, it's funny because I was raised by a Republican in a Republican household and I kind of found, I, I hung out with, with workers because we were you know, very well, you know, I went to school with plenty of people that didn't have money and, you know, learned very quickly, <laughs> you know, that there were a lot more people that, that were out there that didn't, than, than, than had money. So, right. And, and their voice was a lot louder and we needed to take care of them first. And, yeah. and, you know, look, that that's the people that, the, that know that the minute that the people start storming the gates, it's all over for the wealthy. They that's what they have the cops for to protect them. Oh, yeah. And yeah. property. Um, Israel trained. That's right. And aligned. And and now Cop City, <laughs> right, and Cop City right. trained now, too. But now yeah, again, they're training Cop City cops. Yeah. According to Gallup, and again, they, they're corporate. They want to skew the duopoly. Political independence constituted the largest political block of voters in 2023, with an annual average of 43% of American voters claiming that label. All right. It was. It's been more than thirty years. It's more since than they, that, yeah. Oh, it's way more than that. But it's been I'm thirty not buying years. Forty-three. But now, yeah. yeah. What what happened in March? Forty-nine percent of U.S. adults of last year, March last year, forty-nine percent more than the two parties combined. That was the first time that had ever happened. All right. So, and I remember covering that on how do we miss that? Yeah. I was so excited that um, that independents were really starting to make make headway. So here's the scholarly classification of voters as independent dates back to the work of Angus Campbell. And that's publishing in 1960, the American voter, right? The surveys that these researchers analyzed for the book have been considered by many to be the gold standard in the field, but we don't really see too much of that with set with a seven way poll, right? Since 1952, researchers and pollsters have typically asked a follow-up question to those who identify as independents to determine whether respondents prefer one party over the other if they had to vote. Are you really? Like, they, they're they skewing you to duopoly no matter what. They have to give you one of those two and just, right. just choose. Trump or Biden. Trump is Biden. <laughs> Finkel and Einhorn. I mean, it, it's it's literally the Finkel and Einhorn you're choice You're an independent, issue. but you're a Democratic independent, aren't you? No, you're a Republican independent. I'm a left-leaning independent. independent. Uh, no, I'm to right. the left of everybody on the Democratic. Uh, uh, you know, that's right. Um, to the I'm left so of, far left, I've wound up right. I, well, I that, don't know how well, that, That's the fish hook. You, you're admitting to the right. fish hook theory? No, no, come on. The only people that do that is the centrist. The centrist fish hook right to the to the fascists because oh, they do. Scratch, scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds. We know this. <laughs> but most independents reported they lean toward either Democrats or Republicans, go figure, because the polling skews them that way. <laughs> but initially, these surveys asked respondents to identify themselves on a three option scale, but for independence, they probe more deeply, right? Strong Democrat, strong Republican with five options oh, in between. Yeah. Again, just to, so that you can't see them as a whole block, but it has to be kind of, what about strong within the democratic party? You have people that lean to the corporate side and to the, to the left side, but they never break up the Democrats like that, but they have to balkanize independence because it makes them not look as as strong and as large a number. Yeah. Right, but how many lean even? In the 1990s, the idea of nuance came under scholarly scrutiny. Why? Because of thanks to Ross Perot, the myth of the independent voter argued that there were really only the three main categories and that most people who said they were independent really preferred one party or the other. I wonder if that was paid for by the duopoly. <laughs> Come on, you really are just one or the other. You can't be anything else. It, it's amazing. When those independents who report a lean toward party are counted as supporters of that party, the overall proportion of independents is then small, about 10% of the total electorate. Again, you're talking to two of them right here. No matter what, yeah. we don't lean either way. We lean, fuck you. That's where we lean. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're 10% we're of the electorate. Right. And that level has remained roughly consistent, constant since the 1950s because they keep pushing people toward the duopoly. About two-thirds well, of the Well, and I'm not buying this. 
I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that it hasn't changed since the 1950s. We saw it on the rise in 2016. And definitely it's rose since then because so many are are done with the duopoly and throwing their hands in the air. I mean, I see it every day more and more people that are saying no. So, I mean, if you don't call yourself an independent, some people call themselves libertarian. Some people call themselves Green Party. I mean, at the end of the day, are those categorized as the independents in this article? If you're not Democrat or Republican, you're considered an independent. Yep. That's right. So, however, other scholars, including this writer, disagrees with the assertion that most independents are really leaning toward a party. We think there's more volatility in their voter patterns when tracked over time. But what they're saying is that people start and stop being independent because they, they'll join the party. <laughs> Some researchers have argued that independence responses to questions rather than leaning or Democrat or Republican are significantly affected by short-term factors related to whatever campaign is, ha is happening at the time, such as candidates and issues, right? So in 2016, yeah. you might have said, I'm a Bernie guy and I'm, I'm independent, but I, I Democrats a little bit. Now, fuck the duopoly, they're done, right? Yeah. So this is one reason that it would be useful if surveys asked all respondents and not just independents how closely they identified, like I said, balkanize the Republicans, balkanize the Democrats and put everybody on equal footing, but they certainly don't want to do that. We know why they do it. Right. So here, this guy's uh, analyzing data of in political identification, and voting choices and, and what their methodology is. They found evidence that a sizable number of, of independents move in and out of independent status from one election to another. And they argue that there's a need to look at long-term voting behavior of specific voters. Okay, but what does that mean? While there's not a consensus on how many independent voters there are, their numbers do seem to be growing. And I think that that's pretty obvious out there, like you said. Yeah, it's very obvious. The increase may require scholars and media outlets and the public to shift their traditional two-party view of American politics. Oh, God, I hope so. Um, but, of course, we know that we know why there's not a third party, because the donors don't want to write three checks. <clears throat> until we get rid of private financing of elections, until we get rid of Citizens United, until we get rid of every one of our elected officials getting bought off, this isn't yeah. going to change. We're still going to be fed the yeah. duopoly and shoved back into one of these two corporate fucking duopoly parties, uniparty yeah. things. Um, it's possible that the long-standing survey questions are no longer, or maybe never were, actually good at identifying political views of independent voters. Yes, because they're duopolists. They don't understand the mindset of, a, of an independent that right, hates you. Right. We hate you. We yeah. abhor you and loathe you. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense why you wouldn't understand that. This is the article. It's Tom Riley in the, in the, the conversation was the writer. Uh, he is the professor co-director for the Center of an Independent and Sustainable Democracy at Arizona State University School of Public Affairs. Arizona's so, got some of the most messed up elections. I mean, okay, there's quite a few states that can take that that title, right? Most screwed up elections. But Arizona, they did they work very hard to make sure that the voters' voices are not heard. We've seen that over and over. Closing polling places in poorer areas, Sheriff Joe Arpaio doing all kinds yep. of nonsense and then oh, running for Sheriff office Joe. himself. You remember? He'll, yeah. He may even that be guy. back this cycle for all we know. You know, they're now talking about putting armed guards at, oh, or God, armed police not. at the polling locations to try to intimidate uh, uh, voters from potentially showing. I don't know who would be you know, intimidated by somebody with a gun at, at a polling place. You're just there to vote. They have messed with our elections so badly in Washington State. When Bernie ran the first time, when Obama ran, we had um, closed uh, or we had caucuses right for the primary. Right. So caucuses are really hard to suppress the, your voice because. Literally, you're coming together with a group of your neighbors, whoever lives, you know, a five block radius, and you're making your choice. So they, they worked really hard in 2020 and now to make sure that we don't have the caucus in, in Washington State, because what happened is we networked. 
We all met each other at the local school and said, hey, you support Bernie? You want universal health care, too? You want a living fucking wage? You want affordable housing? I want those things, too. Let's get together and let's start working and organizing. And we did. And, uh, you know, I, I hosted or I chaired a meeting every Friday in my local town where 50 or 60 people would show up every Friday afternoon. And this started in March of 2016. And, do you know, we still hold those meetings till today. And, yeah, we don't have the numbers that we used to. And people have come and gone and we all work on different issues. But that happened because of that caucus, because we came together and were able to see each other, talk to each other. And the Democrats didn't want that. And then so they went to this primary system here in Washington state. And I know it's modeled after a couple other states. I think um, Nevada and a couple of the other blue states. But uh, now they're doing the Zoom the Zoom conventions, right? Because you're supposed to get your delegates and then you go to the next level, which is your county convention. And then you have the state convention and then you have the DNC, right? So if they can get us all into a Zoom meeting like they did in 2020 and then just mute us, they don't have to hear our voices anymore. That's and that it. worked so well for them in 2020. Hey, they're going to do it again in 2024. I feel bad that I'm not going to the the DNC this Chicago, year, you know, yeah. going to Chicago because I was there for Philly. And I, but I feel like it's a waste of money and time. All it is is so commercial. I mean, it's just a big coronation party for the Democratic Party. And yeah, I want to be there on the street to protest. But honestly, it's going to be full of infiltrators. There's going to be so many damn cops. You're not going to be allowed to, you know, pop off. There's nothing that's going to happen that they're not prepared for. They they had a freaking prison ready for us in Philly, some old abandoned prison to put us in if we got too rowdy. All they did was kettle us and mislead us the whole entire convention last time. You know, we spent thousands of dollars to go and to travel and. And I just like every day I'm like, oh, I want to go, but I know I can't support the system by showing up there, by giving the Democrats that. Milwaukee 2020. Remember what they did there? Yeah, the virtual oh convention. God. They gave the virtual remember, convention. The, okay, that actually, I was still kind of almost in. They almost could have had I was really mad about the Bernie stuff. I was pretty much checked out and I was laughing at them at this point. Yeah, but the way that they too. the way they shut out AOC and gave her like 30 seconds to talk at the whole thing. And, oh, progressives were dangerous at that point. Oh, they, they were, you know, and that's when, and they, they wouldn't even give TYT credentials to cover the thing live. And I thought that right. was hilarious. And that was pretty much the end of it. I was like, you know, they're never, ever going to give us anything and we're never going to be able to take it. And if you do, you have to compromise and join that corporate suck, you know, the suck of a party. And you have to, you don't, they don't change, you change. And that's, yeah, look, we've exactly. seen it with Cori Bush. We've seen it with Priscilla Jayapal. We've seen it to yes. a point with Rashida Tlaib. She's, she's been holding out, but that's only because all the, all the Zionists can't stand her for being a Palestinian there. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've seen it with Jamal Bowman. Every single one of them goes in and gets compromised and sells out. Um, and, and I, it makes me scared of, of what, you know, with Jose taking on Richie Torres, is he going to be able to stave this off? We've seen much, we've seen incredibly strong people go there, and it scares me. It worries me. Tim Canova, like, look at how hard they took Tim Canova down. I like, I like Jose as a guy, as a person. I've met him three times, and and uh, I wish him all the best. But if he goes there and he becomes a politician, I'm going to hold him with as much contempt as all the other <laughs> 535 motherfuckers you. that's sitting there. You bet. Yeah. All right. You just joined the club. But we see what happens to those those um you know uh, people that accidentally get through like AOC, right? I mean, they eventually they make them useless. They're they're she has no power unless she you know she's shelling for them. She has no power with us because we see through her. You know. So I don't I don't see Jose being that way though. He has been amazing at calling out these politicians. I mean, what, before he was even running, right? Well, as you an know? activist, I, I love him as an activist. All right, but as a right, politician, right. showing up at Jamal Bowman's district to say don't vote for Latimer because Bowman's you know not gonna because APAC doesn't want Bowman. Yeah, I, I get what he's saying and where Is he's that going. What he was doing. Yeah, and that's oh. that ain't it, guy. Like I love you, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah, AM is just yeah. because just because shit is on the ballot doesn't mean you got to vote for poop. <laughs> and he knows that, and he knows that. I know. And it, yeah, it was I a whole thing. Yeah, Anna Mayer says, "Wait, there was a prison set up for protesters in Cal in Philadelphia. Can you expand on that?" 
Yeah, so there was an old abandoned uh, prison in Philadelphia that they were looking to outfit in case things got out of control and they had hundreds of protesters to hold. But what actually happened was uh, they would arrest us and then put us on the bus. Uh, we, I was with a pretty rowdy group that <laughs> a couple of us got arrested. I didn't, but... Uh, they just sit you on a bus in a zip tie for eight hours. No bathroom, no water. It's 110 degrees on the bus. I mean, it was so hot in Philly that year. And uh, at the end of the day, they don't even press charges on you. They've um, they've rendered you useless. You've been, you know, stuck on a bus for eight hours. You're exhausted. You're tired. Uh, they cut you loose at the end of the night and send you on your way. That's how they dealt with the protesters in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Unless so, you were Jill Stein. Unless you were Jill Stein, <laughs> then you got arrested and held for hours. Remember they did that to Jill Stein. I, I, you know, she's she's been arrested several times, and you know, right. it, it almost once is a pattern. You know, you you, you know, it's 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 turning into more of a of a pattern, and and I, I don't like seeing it with her. Uh, she's she she's good. Look, my worry with the whole thing is. What what happened? You know, there's this question about money that was raised after 2016, and letting but you the know party who raised that apart. question. Who raised that cross question, Indy? That was a hit piece that the Democrats put out there about our right? campaign financing. Yes, and most people don't realize that. And I'm not here to defend Jill Stein. If you watch my show, you know I'll rank on her all the time. I do. Yep. But uh, that in particular story was a, a plant story by the DNC. Because she raised a bunch of money to do a to do the recounts, the and count, then they didn't. The and then they didn't do the recounts, so there was like, what right. happened to the money? And there was quite. It, but that's it. It doesn't surprise me. It was a Democratic Party thing. But then what, you know, there was worry that, like Howie Hawkins, as you get, you know, oh, that neoliberal infiltration to the Green Party, and we found out by yep. the way from Bree Joy Gray the other day that apparently five percent is worth twenty million dollars in federal funding, which doesn't go very far. I mean, no, APAC said they were no. going to spend how much against a uh, hundred million just to defeat the squad alone. So seventeen thousand an hour is what APAC is spending right now to buy our government. Seventeen thousand an hour. Silly, silly.